like it's cutting off a little top, but that's okay. I do. This should be fine. I'll just remember that. Okay, I think uh, we're about ready to get started here. So this is um, Entities 201, Creating Custom Entities. My name is Ron. I'm kind of curious, did anyone go to Entities 101 last year? Those hands, a few people? Anybody watch it or look at the slides if you didn't go? It's okay, it's not a prerequisite or anything. Um, anybody in here have experience writing code, custom code in D8? A little bit, some, good. Okay, great. And what about D7? Oh, even better. Fantastic. Okay, so um, I'm a, I've been a Drupal developer for quite some time. Uh, pretty much full stack all the way across. Uh, currently, I'm a senior solutions architect at Acquia, which uh, means I'm a professional problem solver. So uh, I get called in to talk about how Drupal can solve problems and how we can do things that people haven't thought of, and uh, Drupal's really good at that. Um, 
You can find me online pretty much everywhere. Uh, RL Northcutt is usually me, and if it's not, then uh, it's someone's pretending to be me. So um, today's agenda is going to be pretty straightforward. We kind of have it broken into two sections. Uh, the first section is we're going to do a basic entity using Drupal Console. Uh, show of hands, people that have used Drupal Console. Oh, awesome, fantastic. Uh, really, really just fast, just spend a brief few moments on that, uh, just for, for folks uh, following along. And then we're going to spend the majority of the time building a module with a custom entity. And the um, intention here is to kind of go through the process. Uh, it's going to be a very simple example, but we, I want to be very thorough in how we do it. For some folks, it's probably going to be um, just affirming that you already know what you know. Hopefully, for other folks, it'll show you that you don't need to be intimidated because it's um, more complex overall, but the tools make it much easier. And uh, we'll discuss that. So first off, tools and setup. Uh, everything that I'm using, I've got a local dev environment. I'm using Dev Desktop uh, just because I use that uh, at work. Um, for the base site that we're doing for testing, I'm using the uh, Lightning distribution. Uh, it's a nice, uh, nice distro. And uh, there's some inheritance stuff you can do if you want to extend it. So check that out. It's pretty cool. Uh, I'm using Drupal Console for the scaffolding. Part of that is for um, just to be faster. Part of that's also because it's easy, and I'm a developer, so I'm lazy. Uh, and then finally, some type of IDE. I'm going to be using PHP Storm, even though it's a memory hog, but you could use Atom or TextPad or Vim or whatever you like. Uh, it won't really change much. So for the first part, we want to create a basic entity. And for those that remember from last year, uh, an entity is um, a loadable thingy that's optionally fieldable. So we want to be able to create a thingy. Uh, to do so, uh, we've got a, a handful of steps to generate the module to house it, to generate the placeholder code for the entity itself, uh, take a quick look, and then turn it on and see how it works. So this is going to be down and dirty pretty quick. And um, these are the commands um, that we're going to be using here. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, for folks that, that don't know, Drupal Console is a really great um, command line tool, kind of in the vein of Drush. Uh, it has some similarities, but it does things in a different way. It's built on top of Symphony Console. It also does some very cool things otherwise. So if you install it, it's nice because it gives you some uh, uh, scaffolding that allows you to generate different types of code. In this case, we'll be doing a module and um, an entity, but you can also do plugins, permissions, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, interesting side note, I just learned not long ago that this is actually powered by Twig under the hood in console, uh, which is actually kind of cool. So let's, do, um, let's go ahead and generate the module. And it's just going to take us through a series of questions. And as we answer them, it's going to do all the hard work for us. So we've got a thingy. We'll use the same machine name. Custom thingies. Uh, we'll go ahead and get a module file, even though we don't need it. Uh, we won't do this as a feature. Don't need a JSON. No dependencies. We'll keep it simple, so no templates and no unit tests. And we'll go ahead and confirm generation. Boom. Now we have a module. So the next step is to go through and create our custom entity. And for folks, um, that's all. The, uh, the, the session last year. Um, everything is an entity in Drupal now. The, uh, the thing that's different is that there are two types, content and config. Uh, content entities are things that we think about like content types and users and taxonomy. Um, config entities are things like views, um, image styles, etc. Call this a thingy. Good. I'm going to just stick with the defaults for most of this. We'll go ahead and add bundles, because that's always fun. Sure, make it revisionable. Fantastic. OK, there we go. Now we have a thingy module. So uh, let's enable it and see what happens. 
So technically, this was uh, kind of the, the teaser in the description that we're going to generate a custom entity in under five minutes. And that's exactly what we've just done. Now, it's, it's, it's a pretty dumb entity at this point. Uh, you can see that uh, we can create different types, just like you'd expect from content types. So uh, thingy type one. And then um, we can also modify this, uh, go through and, and add fields, do all the normal stuff that you'd expect. And we can go ahead and add thingies now. Great. So it works. Lovely. Um, now this right, right out of the box without doing anything else isn't overly useful, right? I mean, at this point, it's, it's really just kind of a weaker node. Um, but the, the important thing is that right now without ever, aside from the command line, I haven't touched any code, I haven't written any code, I've got a functional module and I've got a functional um, custom entity that I can now go and iterate on and create and work with to do the stuff I want to do. And out of the box, it works. You turn it on, it doesn't blow up your site. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, that's like a big deal. Okay. So pretty quick, um, pretty handy. Definitely something to play with, and again, it'll take you five minutes. So if you haven't already done so, or if you're not doing so now, which some people might be, then give it a shot. So that was the, the first part. Very quick, very simple, and now is where we get down to the fun part. Um, so what we want to do is we want to create a, a more complicated custom entity, and by the time we get done, we're going to understand why in order to accomplish what we wanted to do, we had to have a custom entity to do that. In this case, I'm going to be basically mimicking CSS injector at a low level um, in D7, also asset injector is what it's called in D8. Uh, pretty straightforward. Nice little tool, good for doing quick demos or if you've got people that you don't want them to be able to touch code but they want to do things, if you want to iterate quickly. But one of the nice things about this example is it lets us touch a whole lot of different parts of Drupal uh, all very simply. So we're going to be creating content types. We have to define a schema. Let's see if I've got this here. Um, we've got to actually add um, some additional methods that aren't provided out of the box. We're going to be messing with the file system. We're going to be creating files and deleting them and trying to do some garbage upkeep. Um, we've got to do some stuff at the install of the module to make sure that it's prepped and ready. And then we've also got to go through, and the really fun part is we have to figure out how to take these um, CSS and possibly JavaScript files that we don't know where they are or what they're going to be called, but we have to figure out how to put them into a library and attach them to the page uh, dynamically. And luckily, uh, Drupal gives us the ability to do all of this. So as I go through this, um, what I could do is I could actually just talk through it, enable a module, and we could go. And that would probably be the smart thing to do, but um, I thought it might be a little bit more fun if we just kind of go through the code sa snippets and then um, kind of package it and put it together, and hopefully I don't miss a semicolon and it works at the end. So um, that'll be me going down in flames if it doesn't work. But let's go back over and let's uh, go through the process we just did. This time we'll make a few changes. We'll pay a little bit closer attention to the process as we go along. So the first thing we want to do is we want to define our module. In this case, we'll just call it asset. That'd be a horrible name for a module, by the way, because there's stuff in Drupal called asset. You don't want to do that, but we're going to do that just for fun. DC217, 2017. Set example, nice, okay. So we definitely want to create a module file and that's where we're going to need to put some of our code as we'll see later. Um, we don't currently want to define this as a feature because I'm not currently interested in, in trying to take um, some configuration from the UI and shove it in there, but that is something that you could potentially do. Uh, that would be actually really helpful if you um, were working on a, a custom module for your own project or for a customer's project. Uh, don't need a composer.json, 
don't have any dependencies. Unit tests, it actually would be actually really good if I did a unit test, but I didn't. I'm trying to keep this simple. Uh, themable template, no. Again, I want to try and keep this as simple as possible. It's going to spit out a ton of code, so let's limit it. And there we go. So now we actually have uh, our module. Great. So now let's generate the actual entity and um, then we'll be, we'll be all set. So we've got, uh, we'll call it asset. This is good. Um, I would probably put it someplace else in practice, but we'll leave it under structure for now. Uh, no bundles, although that is an interesting idea. Uh, translatable is fine, revisionable is cool. Okay, there we go. So that's it. Now we're done, right? No, we're not. Okay. So now we've created our entity, and it's got the usual stuff. Um, however, we've got to add some additional fields to the database schema in order for us to be able to take some of the information we're saving and push it in there. And this process is, these are probably the longest individual snippets that we're going to see, except for one. Um, and what you'll notice that's going on here, there's a couple of different things. One is we're not just defining the schema. We also are taking this opportunity to go through and talk about the way it's going to be presented to the user with the form. We could do this in other ways, but this is actually really handy because I can determine if something is required, if this particular field is revisionable versus another, um, which is very powerful. Um, some of the other options that are there, and as you can see, we actually are able to set whether or not um, the, the display or the form are going to be configurable. So in theory, you can take your custom entity and you can make it so that people can actually extend it through the UI later. We won't be doing that in this example, but it's, uh, it's pretty nice that you have that ability. So let's go ahead and grab this and come over and we'll see that this is actually created. Unfortunately, I think this might be a little small. Um, well, that's not horrible. So uh, what we're seeing inside the module is, is kind of the basic stuff that you'd expect. And again, I haven't created any of these files. This was all done for me. The actual entity file itself, and it's almost entirely what we're going to be using, is going to be under uh, source entity um, asset.php. And I know, it's, it's kind of silly. It's, it's 256 lines of code that I haven't written. But um, if you make sure that you're paid based on lines of code, you should have custom entities all over the place. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pro tip. OK. So what I typically like to do is um, go through and refine this and figure out what do I need or not need. Do I really need to know the last time that it was updated? Does it matter who the author is? Maybe it does. In this case, we're just going to leave the boilerplate there and just keep it nice and simple. So let's go ahead and add our new field here. Uh, the second one, uh, so the, the first field, I'm sorry, is uh, the actual content. So basically we're just creating a, um, a, a large text area where we're going to put whatever our CSS is. The second thing we want is the actual type of um, content that this is. Now in this case, we're just talking about whether it's CSS or JavaScript, but um, it could be extended later to be other things. You could have, like for example, if you want to be able to add um, sprites or CSS images or things like that, uh, you could add that capability as well. Um, of course, then you probably want to take this in a different direction. Let's go ahead and add that one in. And then the, uh, the last one that we have here is for the actual URI. Now, one thing to note here is that um, we are using uh, the, the URI system in Drupal to determine how these things work. So we're not trying to write out the full path uh, to where these files are going to be located or where they should be. And the reason for that is because we don't know that could change. Now, as a friend of mine showed me earlier, there are ways that we could work around that, and there could be advantages or disadvantages, but for all intents and purposes, uh, we're just going to assume that we're putting this into the public file system, and um, that's, that's all she wrote. Okay, so we're good here. We'll go ahead and save. 
Right. Step two of 46. No, I'm kidding. Just seeing if anyone's paying attention. So the, uh, the next thing we want to do is we actually want to modify the interface. Um, this is going to be really useful for if, um, if we start extending this later or making it useful for other things. Um, mostly, I, I kind of just wanted to put this in here just so you guys have a sense of how this works because this interface, asset interface, is actually what's being used in this, um, here we go, uh, in this actual um, uh, class. So um, we're going to have to match whatever we're putting in the interface in here as well. But this just makes it, uh, this just keeps it nice and easy for us. We could probably skip this and be OK. But again, just want to be a little thorough. Um, so let's go into the next piece. So we want to take those individual functions that we added, and we actually want to put the guts in uh, for what they're going to do on this entity, these methods. And this is where we're actually starting to, you know, outside of the schema, we're actually starting to write code now. And what you're seeing here is an example of what we're going to see over and over through this, where you actually have some very small, relatively simple functions, any one of which is not that crazy and not that scary. So if you look at the first one, get type, all we're doing is we're just returning whatever the type is for this particular entity, CSS or JavaScript. Very, very simple. For get file name, uh, we're actually going through grabbing the name, making it lowercase, replacing the spaces and special characters with an underscore. We see this with machine names all the time. In fact, I stole that, uh, the regex from somewhere in core because I don't like regex, and it worked out very nicely. Um, and then finally, uh, get file URI, which takes those other two functions, get file name and get type, and actually uses those to generate what that URI should be based on the current state. Uh, now, what you'll notice is that all the way through this, we're referencing this. And this is kind of one of those magic words, and it's talking about whatever object, whatever entity we're working with um, right now. That can be a little strange until you get used to it. But then once you get used to it, it's really, really cool. Because then you don't have to worry about the abstraction of which particular entity am I working with. You just know that within the realm of this object, when I instantiate this object, the methods that I'm calling are going to work on it. Um, so it encapsulates and keeps it all together. Does that kind of make sense? Maybe? So uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and take this and drop this stuff in. And this is one of the places where we're actually starting to break away from the, um, from the default of the boilerplate that was put in place. Okay. So uh, now we're starting to talk about uh, the next step we want to do is we actually want to be able to save the files. And so what... Uh, what I did was I wrote the methods, we'll see in a moment, to save the file. And um, I tied them in and wired it up and went to go save it. And I got a big flaming error because it's trying to save to a folder that doesn't exist. Uh, real bonehead moment. So uh, what we want to do is we want to make sure that that folder does exist before we try and do anything. And um, a lot of people might be very happy to know that uh, the process for doing that is almost identical to what it was in 7. That's an install file, and there's some hooks you can throw in there, which we will actually go do right now. So if you, uh, if you were no Drupal 7, this should be very comfortable for you. So uh, asset.install. Great. All righty. So um, first things first. Uh, I highly recommend shamelessly stealing code that works whenever you can. And you can refine it later. You can work on it and make it your own. But uh, it's a, the secret to my success. And so what I did was, knowing that the image styles uh, module creates folders, um, I just went and grabbed that same code and I made a few tweaks. As you can see, it's actually doing the exact same thing three times. It's just um, creating a different um, variation. There's probably a more elegant way to do this, 
but um, this works out quite well, and it's highly readable, very maintainable, which is something else that I believe in. Um, this might be something that you're writing that you're not going to touch for another six or nine months, and you're trying to figure out what something was. So I highly recommend trying to keep it clean. Um, or, you know, the old adage, you should write your code like the next person that's going to work on it is an axe-wielding maniac that knows where you live. So make it, make it easy. Make it understandable. All righty. So uh, we've got here two things. The first is the install, which is actually going through and creating those folders uh, for us. So every time we install this module, it's going to create the folders, and we're good to go. Uh, however, we also want to make sure we clean up after ourselves. So whenever we uninstall the module, it's actually going to delete. And you can see I actually still have generated images there. So I totally stole it. Uh, it's actually just going to delete the entire folder and everything under it, because we're using delete recursive. Um, pretty simple, right, to go through and start manipulating the file system uh, in the public folders. Very simple, very easy. Okay. And now that's uh, one, more, one more file down. So now that we've got a place where we can actually store and save these, uh, the files, we need to actually write the code that does it. And again, uh, it's, it's three lines to do this. Let's jump back over to our entity and drop this in. So as you can see, we're using the get file, file URI, which is basically, I probably should have called that generate file URI, honestly. But as we've already established, I'm lazy and it's easier to type get. Um, so we're generating what that URI should look like based on the name of this particular CSS file, what type it is, et cetera. Uh, grabbing the, the content, the guts of it, and then just writing that out. Uh, one thing to make note of is that we are using the, um, the file exists replace flag in that uh, unmanaged save data function. It, we, uh, I think the next one is file exists. I don't remember. Basically, it's the one where it adds underscore zero, underscore one, underscore two. Uh, we don't want to do that. Because the database is actually going to be storing all of our revisions, which is very cool. So we can actually go back and, and see things back in time. We don't have to worry about that here. All righty. Now, once we've um, got the ability to save the file, we also need to have the ability to delete the file. And again, pretty straightforward. Let's uh, try this again. And what we're doing here is um, actually going through and just saying, uh, let's, let's pass through this, um, this parameter for the URI. If we don't send it, then it's just going to delete whatever the current um, asset we're working with is. Uh, but we can specifically say which one to delete. And that's going to be important later uh, when we start talking about garbage collection. Uh, one thing I also want to mention here is that you'll notice we're using this uh, file unmanaged save data function. And there's a difference between files that are managed by Drupal and files that are not. So if we were to use uh, a managed file, that would actually create a file entity. It would have it listed in the list of files in the Drupal UI. Um, you would be able to manage and manipulate it that way. And that might be an interesting use case. Here, uh, we want the, uh, the interface that we're creating to kind of abstract that away so that people aren't going to get confused and say, why did we add a CSS file? I don't, this doesn't make sense to me. All righty. And then the, the last thing we have to do is uh, we're going to be able to, we're going to want to clear the cache after we update a file so that it will actually show up. So about an hour ago, I got a text from a friend of mine who couldn't make it to the con. And um, I said, yeah, I'm just going over my slides. And he said, um, oh, man, you know, trying to give me advice. Just talk about entities and objects and things and D8. And then at the very tail end, he said, oh, and be sure to clear cache. So I, I took a screenshot of this slide and sent it. And I was like, that's sage advice. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, this isn't anything new. I went into the core and common.inc 
um, the, the core function for Drupal flush all caches, and I just pulled out the piece for CSS and JavaScript, and I plopped it in here. Um, I should note that these, you, calling it this way through the service is actually deprecated, so you don't want to rely on this, but if you go look at Drupal flush all caches, you'll see that, and uh, you'll know what to do. So, good stuff. Mostly, it's just easy. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Step seven. So, um, how many folks here have worked with object oriented programming before? Fantastic. So, for, for those folks who may not have, one of the things that makes um, object oriented programming so powerful is the ability to extend. Um, objects and then either replace those methods or functions that are tied to them or um, augment them, if you will. And that's precisely what we're doing here. So in Drupal 7 days, uh, if we wanted to do something, in this case, after we save the new asset, we want to go through and we want to save it down to a file and we want to clear the cache. In Drupal 7, we would just use a um, uh, a, a node or an, an entity, um, what would it be? It's not entity save. Goodness, it's been a while. Does anybody? No, no bonus points for helping me out. It's like after you save an entity and then it runs the hook. What's that hook in seven? Okay, yeah, there's a pre save, update, yeah. So, okay, so there's a couple. Obviously, I've been away too long. Uh, in this case, we actually have the, a similar thing. In this case, it's post save. That would be like update. Now, what you can do is you can either go in and just kind of guess at some of these things or the smarter thing to do, uh, which eventually is where I ended up, is taking a look at what you're extending. In this case, we're extending the revisionable content entity base, which um, I believe just extends the content entity base, which I believe extends just the entity base. Um, and each one of those is either adding or slightly changing some methods. So you might have to look in a couple places to see what's there. But some of the stuff that we see all over the place, uh, like the post save, is what you'll expect. The thing that's really cool here, though, is you'll notice the second line is we're taking, we're actually calling the post save on that parent entity, uh, the parent class, before we do anything else. And if we didn't have that line, we would basically be replacing it. So what this enables us to do is to augment and extend that without losing anything upstream and without having to worry about what's going on up there. So this is why the uh, going object oriented, while it can be more complex, adds a lot of really cool and interesting things. It makes it very easy. So now we're writing this function and we're down to just three lines. Moreover, the lines that we have, um, specifically save file and clear file cache, are, as we've already seen, easy to understand. They make a lot of sense. There's nothing crazy there. Even though those are built on functions, which are built on functions, which are built on functions, it, it's a very, very complicated system. But because it's so well structured and so well organized, it makes our job much, much easier. I've actually um, heard of some very large implementations, um, thousands of sites on a single code base, and um, massive uh, project that's even at full velocity is going to take several years. And actually, as they progressed, their velocity has actually gone up. Because number one, the developer is more comfortable. Number two, they're reusing the same components over and over again. And number three, even when they have to go back and do something, it's much easier for people to understand. And usually you don't hear about that, about a project getting more complicated and yet going faster. But because we have such a great architecture, it actually does enable us to do that. So the other thing we want to do, again, with the garbage collection being good stewards, is we want to make sure that after we delete the parent entity, one of those assets, that CSS in the database, we want to go through and actually delete the file as well. And we have that lovely delete file method that we created to take care of that for us. So uh, we're good to go. OK. So at this point, we, we pretty much have everything that we need. Um, 
we could turn this on right now and we can actually generate assets and have that save and delete the files back and forth and all of that stuff's going to work. Of course, now we have to attach it to the page and that's where um, things get a little tricky. Luckily, it's, uh, it's not horribly difficult and all of this should be very familiar to uh, folks from D7 because we're going to do this in the actual module file itself, which is nuts. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to actually go in and add the use statement for that asset entity that we created. And if we go back to the asset.php, we can see that the namespace is Drupal slash asset slash entity, and it is the asset class with a capital A. That's how we know how to grab this. So what we could actually do is in the one place we need to call it, we could call it in this way. Uh, we could say, here, I'll jump over here. We could actually say asset equals um, all of this stuff, uh, load multiple. And uh, I actually did this when testing. And load multiple is a, a default. We could actually do something like this. And since we're only using it right now in one place in my code, that actually wouldn't be so bad. However, we don't know what's gonna happen later or how else we're, we might need to extend this. So we're gonna go ahead and put it in as a use statement so we don't have to worry about it. And this is a great example of um, how object-oriented program allows us to lazy load stuff. Because if you recall, in, in D7, with Bootstrap, you're loading everything. The upside there is that if you go into a .module file and you call um, a function, you know that function's there because that module file knows about every single function that exists. The downside is every single time you hit the page and you're trying to load something up, it loads up all of Drupal all over again. Uh, caching helps with that, but at the end of the day, we, we wanna try and make use of this so that we can get really, really fast. And once you start talking about things like um, APIs and kind of doing things at more of the machine level, that speed um, really starts to pay off. So this is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. Now, um, has anybody here added in D8, added a library, CSS, JavaScript, and a module? A few people, okay. It can be a little bit weird. You have to create a YAML file which defines what a library is um, for this module, and then you have to go in and attach it to something, to a page, to a form, to an element, and that's what tells Drupal how to pull that in. In this case, we can't create that YAML file because we have no idea what these files are gonna be called, where they might be located, or how many of them there will be. So what we have to do is we are using uh, this wonderful hook library info build. And what this allows us to do is to go through and define the structure, the actual array that the YAML file represents. In this case, it's gonna be blank, right? Um, and then we're loading all of the assets. So every single one of those asset entities that we have, we're gonna load up the batch, we're gonna loop through that batch, and each one individually, we're gonna add into that um, array. At the end of the line, we're gonna return that entire array that we've now constructed, and we're gonna be doing that periodically just to make sure that we've got it. So basically what we're doing here is instead of using the YAML file that we typically would do, we're creating that array and we're creating the content of that file dynamically and passing it directly into Drupal so it knows which files are associated with this library. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is probably uh, the trickiest part of this whole thing. Everything else has been very, very simple. Okay, so we're adding this in. And then the, uh, now that we've actually got a, a library defined, we have to actually add it to a page. In this case, we're using hook page attachments alter because we're gonna add it to every single page. Um, again, in the theme of keeping things simple. Great, done. So at this point, um, 
if you were developing this, you've probably been going through and turning the module, yeah, installing it, uninstalling it, testing it, getting bugs, seeing what happens. I mean, maybe not. I mean, that's, that's my experience. Uh, but at this point, I noticed that I went in and I had a, um, I, I had an asset that I'd created and I changed the title. I'm going through checking revisions, all this stuff works. And then all of a sudden I look and I've got a backlog of test one, test five, test two, test seven. Every single time I'm changing the title, it's creating a new file. And so I have to have a way to go through and be able to delete that because if it's named exactly the same, it will delete it automatically. But if we change the name uh, once that um, asset's been created, it's going to create another one. And so we're going to end up with stuff floating around out there. So basically what I did was created another um, method here called dedupe. Um, it grabs the, the actual old URI that will need to be stored in the database. It generates the new one for the current asset in case we've changed the title, compares them, and if they're different, then we call delete file on the old one. And you'll notice that every other time we've called delete file, we haven't been passing in a parameter because it's just been assuming to use whatever the current asset is. But because we uh, added that um, parameter in, we now have the ability to, with the same method, pass in um, uh, this old one. So it will delete that before it creates a new one. Okay. <coughs> so we've got this in place. And then this is that the final step here. So we need to call the dedupe, and we also need to um, add the URI to the database because we haven't done that yet. We haven't actually created a form space for it. We don't want someone to just write it in because it's going to be wrong. Um, and the, the trick is that this has to be done before you save the new entity because as soon as you save the new entity, it will write the URI, then the one in the database and the one from that you've generated will mo both match. So can anyone guess how we might do this? Anyone have an idea? No? It's okay. Everyone's asleep. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to go in and do this in the pre-save. And the pre-save was actually generated for us as part of the uh, boilerplate. So I don't have to create that. I can just drop this stuff in, and we're good to go. It's saying dedupe is not found. Did I not copy this in? Let's see. Yeah, I put it in the wrong place, didn't I? I did. That's why it's a total risk. Okay. It's also why it's good to have a, a nice IDE in place because it can help you catch those things before you start ripping your hair out. Lovely. Okay. So now uh, we have our module. And it should work. So let's find out. I'm only slightly nervous about that. Okay, so let's uh, enable. Okay. So far it hasn't blown up. This is good. Okay, so step one, we were able to enable, the, the module's turned on and, and nothing has been destroyed so far. Step two, we check the site and uh, it's still going, so this is good. So step three, let's go and actually test this thing out. Um, so we have the asset list. Let's go ahead and add an asset. We'll call this um, test number one. It's a CSS, and we'll do something that will be easy to see that it's changed. That should let us know. And we've got revisions, so that's cool. Let's see, I might need to clear cache again. Get it started. Always have to uh, um, be mindful when you're running a demo that something is going to go wrong. So you're just hoping it's not something big. 
Also, don't be afraid to tell people that uh, when you do mess up, that that's how they know that it was live and you did it on purpose, just to prove this isn't canned. So apparently this is working. So let's go take a quick look. And uh, thank you, thank you. The bar is low, that's good. Uh, so it did create our folders. It's actually created our uh, test one. Actually, I want to see something here. Let's go back to our um, new asset and let's change it. So let's change it to um, change title. We'll add something else. I'm not a designer, folks. <laughs> And then let's watch uh, the file um, finder over there and just see what happens. Oh, okay, boom. So it deleted the old one and it created the new one. Everything looks like it works. And I probably have something wrong with my um, caching. That's lovely. But I think that at that point, I think I've earned my, um, my woohoo on that. So that was, that's really what I was trying to get to with this entire session. Yeah, thanks. So, so why does this make sense to do this as a custom entity other than because I wanted to have a session that would just demonstrate that? A couple of things. One is we created, a, we needed a custom schema for this. And more importantly, we have the ability to put this all in a single table. So if I go create a new content type for this and I try and do something weird, every single file field that I add is going to add another one or two tables in the database. So if you have a custom entity, let's say you're pulling something in from an external system and you've got 20, 50 pieces of data, that's going to be a huge mess in your database. But even if you do nothing else but just give it a place to live that's all in a single table, that's going to be much more efficient and it's going to keep things much cleaner. So that's a really good use case for having a custom entity. Um, I had some additional methods that we needed particularly around files and saving and all of those fun things. And we had some additional workflow steps, a clear caching, which apparently I need to dig into a bit more. Um, and then we were also taking the default methods and we had to extend them. And part of that was due to the new structure, part of that was due to the, the dedupe kind of garbage collection thing. So extending um, those um, default methods, uh, anytime you're, you're starting to do something crazy, that might be a, a good time to start looking at um, a custom entity. So uh, a couple of final notes. Uh, looks like we're just about on time here. Uh, first off, the, the best way to learn is just to get in and play with this. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'm, these were very simple functions. Um, everyone seems to get each piece individually and all the pieces make sense. And I think some people were looking at me like I was a doofus for even explaining it. but. Um, but going through and actually doing it versus seeing it is going to actually help it sync. So I highly recommend that. Um, all you need is a little bit of time. If you wanted to use something like this as, a, um, as an example, if you want to just take um, a Drupal console, generate your scaffolding and go, you should be fine. And above all, just keep things simple and don't try and architect the end state out of the gate. A much better way to go is to find that MVP do as little as possible, test it, see if it works, give yourself a high five, and then just add another little bit of complexity on top of that. Oh, uh, sorry, one last thing. Uh, homework, I always give homework, sorry. Um, so everyone that's here now should have the basics they need to create some type of custom entity, custom module. So I think it'd be a really great thing to do. Uh, it'd be even better if you were able to take that and either port a module from seven to eight, or possibly create your own, uh, or at least get s help someone get started on that process by just going through and doing something rough and dirty, and then they come in and, and help, help you clean it up. Uh, there are a lot of resources out there uh, that you can go take a look at that are way better than this, so I would highly recommend you do that. And then finally, uh, in your next project, uh, don't look for an excuse to use a custom entity, but keep custom entities in mind 
as a way to solve a problem that otherwise might be unwieldy, difficult, or um, hard to maintain, confusing, et cetera. And with that, uh, I'm done, unless there's any questions. Uh, yes, if you if you send it to me, I'll grade it and I'll put a sticker. So, yeah. In fact, you get a sticker just for asking. That's good. How do you decide when to use uh, versus the biggest way? Um, I, Again, it depends on what I'm trying to accomplish. If it's going to be, if I'm going to create a, a content type. So the the question is, when do you choose content type versus custom entity? If I'm going to create a content type that is going to be incredibly complex, and I don't necessarily need the flexibility of the UI to be constantly changing and shifting that around, I'll probably do that as a custom entity because I want to keep that a lot more efficient in the database, uh, if that makes sense. And we want to kind of lock that down. Now, what, it, what can be really handy, though, is to actually go through and use a, um, create a custom content type on just a sandbox site. And, and go through and actually work out how you want it to work. What do you want the form to look like?